Stephen that is asking about um, the hearing aids and Bluetooth. That's a huge question. These days, I see it every other day. It looks on Instagram, on Facebook. Some people send me, okay, Nick, you tell me not to put a phone on my head, right? Never like this with a phone. I understand why, because, you know, it might it might be a class one carcinogen. It's linked with blood brain barrier opening, oxidative damage, reduction of mitochondrial energy, blah, blah, blah. I understand these risks. And you tell me that the Bluetooth earbuds are not good because they're emitting even deeper into the brain. But now my audiologist is telling me to get new hearing aids and it's going to be essentially a Bluetooth piece in my ear for basically hours and hours every day. But on the flip side, it's helping me hear, which is super important. It's, 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 it's a key aspect of living right, of being just happy, being able to communicate, hear things, listen to music. So it is a difficult situation because I've been told by many of these people that increasingly it is very, very difficult to find non-Bluetooth hearing aids. It's all going Bluetooth, controllable by your phone, and some technology relies on the fact that it's always connected. I recommended the product on the forums that is called the Signia Pure 10 NX, like Nick's Nick X. So Signia Pure 10 NX. This is one without Bluetooth. But what happened for Steven is he told his audiologist about this product and the audiologist said, well, this is a five-year-old product that is pretty much deprecated, right? It's being rolled out. So he's not recommending it. So he said, Stephen says that is, so I'm between a, a rock and a hard place, so to speak. I suspect I'm not the only one. So are you aware of any discussion among EMF experts that have assessed the hazards of such Bluetooth-enabled hearing aids? Have you heard anything, Brian? Because all I heard from scientists and doctors is concerns, but no solutions. Have you heard about other people that have figured something out, how to turn off the Bluetooth, or um, I, I feel very lost myself about this question, to be quite honest, where there's uh, fewer and fewer solutions on the market, but at the same time, these people want to hear something. So uh, yeah. it's a risk, but it's a benefit. Yeah. Well, I would say, um, number one, let's just step back from that question real quick and and talk about like, uh, the, like the use of, of the hearing aids, like when, when can you get a break from, from them if you have to use them? That's, that's the first question. So think of thinking about that. Like, do you need to hear when you're sleeping and your spouse is snoring next to you? Probably not. You probably don't need your, your hearing aids in then. Right. Yeah. Uh, so like, just thinking about that in terms of like logging your day and saying, when do I need them? When do I not need them? Uh, and when is it pleasurable to use them? Like if I'm out walking in nature, I would like to hear the birds chirping. I'd like to hear this and that. That's going to be uh, something that's that's a no brainer. Like you want you want to be able to hear. Uh, so like when can you get a break from them? When when is the best time to to actually utilize their their convenient use to enjoy life? And then uh, the other the other aspect of this is: Are there any uh, non Bluetooth hearing aids? Um, it seems to be just like with most products, they're starting to phase out anything that doesn't have wireless. Um, I will say this though: like uh, over the years, I've tested a few different hearing aids that do have Bluetooth, and they were extremely uh, low power output compared to a typical Bluetooth in like a headset. Okay, um, this is good news. Yeah, I think that these um, companies that that are uh, putting out medical devices are um, are very cautious as far as the power output. They want it to function, but they don't want it to go overboard in uh, in because of fear of a lawsuit potentially. I think they're actually pretty smart. Like people that make hearing aids, people that make pacemakers, they're a whole different breed of uh of of capitalism and and uh uh and uh recklessness 
than than somebody who's making them for listening to music. Um, it's it's a medical device, and if it's hurting their health, someone's health, then they're liable or for that. Uh, in the music industry, maybe not so much because it, they're just relying on the FCC and and all of these things. So, um, so I would say like like you know I, I hate to answer the question like this, but basically you really have to test um, each one, and you're going to have to do it inside of a Faraday cage to get an accurate reading, so that you don't have as much interference. And the ones that I've tested, um, it wasn't the number one EMF problem that the person was exposed to. Um, because of the low power level from Bluetooth, basically. Yeah. Even though it was very close to their body, I was right up on it measuring and I could still barely detect it. And this was in a place that was somewhere in like rural or southern Ohio. And it was like one of those areas where like Green Bank, where there's hard, you can't even get a radio station. Yeah. And this lady had these hearing aids and... And she wanted me to test them and they were Bluetooth. And, you know, as far as Bluetooth goes, I would say it's like one five hundredth of the power, the, the one that I tested. This was probably two years ago. Um, so things have probably changed since then. But I would I would say like, you know, if they've made them more powerful, then scratch everything I just said. But you definitely have to get an RF meter and test it. Yeah. Number one. And so, so if I if I summarize, I that that's very good advice. Summarize is time of use. If you can, you know, take breaks sometimes, and you don't need them, remove them instead of maybe just having the habit like some people have with earbuds. They just leave them on, but they don't listen to anything. It's more like you know a, a fashion statement. Maybe with hearing aids, certain people are just putting them on in the morning, not thinking twice, and maybe removing them before bed. But if you can take breaks and you know there's Bluetooth in there, uh, do take breaks. So you're going to reduce your your time of exposure. And then talk with your audiologist, uh, even if it doesn't mean you're going to change anything. Because if you talk about these concerns to audiologists, you are changing society long term. Yeah. You are changing what type of discussions will these audiologists have at their next congress of whatever, whatever audiology and I, I don't know where it's going to be uh, someplace exciting like Baltimore at a, at a four day conference with audiologists and they will talk about it. They will say, well, you know, my patients have these concerns. Are they valid? They're going to look at the medical literature uh, around Bluetooth. They're going to realize that at Stanford, there's a guy called Dr. Andrew Uberman that said, well, you know, given the uncertainty around radio frequency, we should probably not put uh, earbud that is Bluetooth in the ear. I'm a little bit uneasy with this uh, situation, he said. And he said, I don't use Bluetooth anything anymore. So that would, in that case, include the hearing aids. And it's, if if its stance is, is what you want to follow. So it is interesting that things are evolving. And I think that if there's Bluetooth in the future, maybe they're going to make sure that it emits towards the exterior, for example, so not towards the user, so a shielding inside the hearing aid and things like that. They could they could be made much safer and, and in a way that is even more uh, respectful of the Alara principle, as low as reasonably achievable, but it's going to take some time. But if you bring these dangers to your audiologist, you are helping move this forward, even just a tiny bit, but it is important to have this conversation and maybe send them the, send them uh, some links to the data, to uh, the data around the fact that this is a class 2B carcinogen. And you say, well, it's in my ear. And there's been a recall over iPhone 12 that I talked about a little bit sooner in this conversation. Just these concerns, if they make it to your uh, audiologist's ear, no pun intended, uh, well, it's going to contribute to something. So we don't have a perfect answer here, but there are older models and some of them hopefully are still low powered. And I, I would think to preserve battery life in such a small device, it is likely that the power is very low. So that's something at least positive. Hey, this is Nick, the EMF guy, Pino. You know, I am the co-creator of the EMF circle along with my colleague, Brian Hoyer from Shielded Healing. What you saw today, this short video is a 
preview of the longer interview that we did for our circle members. Every month we have a masterclass like one of these or a Q&A session with me and Brian most of the time. So you get personal support and attention on your EMF reduction journey. So if you want to reduce EMF because you are personally sensitive or you're just trying to take precautionary measures to better your health and minimize the risk associated with wireless and other types of EMFs, then the EMF circle is the place to be. We have a ton of archives now. We have several months worth of Q&As that you can listen back to. Everything is pre -record is recorded. You can either join live or just listen to the replay. So we have a cars masterclass. We have a pr free protection masterclass uh, uh, also that we did. And we're going to have several other masterclasses moving forward. So we hope that you join us inside the EMF circle. Just visit EMF circle.com or click the link under the video to join us. I hope to see you then.